Welcome to the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast, brought to you by New England Biolabs. I'm your host, Lydia Morrison, and here's hoping this show offers you some new perspective. Today, I'm joined once more by Reforest the Tropics Executive Director, Greg Powell. Reforest the Tropics is a nonprofit organization working to reduce atmospheric carbon through reforestation. I first met Greg a couple of years ago, as NEB was on the brink of supporting a 100 hectare reforestation project in Costa Rica, which was managed by Reforest the Tropics. Hi, Greg. Welcome back to the NEB podcast. I'm so glad you could join us. Yes, thank you for having me, Lydia. So for those in our audience who aren't familiar yet with Reforest the Tropics, could you explain the organization's mission? Yes, the mission of Reforest the Tropics is to create a reforestation model that's improved um, over the currently available options or the historical options. If we look at the history of reforestation, um, it has it's it's got a sort of a checkered past in terms of overall success. Typically, what happens is projects that are geared towards generating some sort of income for partnering landowners or landowners within the the tropics especially need to have a financial component to them. In other words, they need to generate income for the, the landowners in order to incentivize them to participate over the long term. And how that has most often been accomplished is through the creation of um, single species monocultures. In other words, people are, are farming trees. And although it is effective in terms of carbon capture and it does generate income for those landowners, um, it's not really the approach that we want to take for a sort of a, a wider global strategy towards reforestation. So where Reforest the Tropics comes in is still putting a focus on the needs of those landowners so we can get roots in the ground, but doing so in a much more environmentally and ecologically responsible way. We are uh, developing and deploying a mixed species model that is biodiverse, is healthy for the environment, that also meets those needs of the landowners to to get them to participate in the project over the long term. Um, So our model is really trying to change the way that we approach reforestation, um, again, with, especially within the tropics, to cr- create a competitive option that is an improvement over what is most car- commonly being planted. So can you tell us a little bit more about the mix of trees that are planted? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we've over the years, we've uh, experimented with a number of different models in terms of different species that we've mixed together. Typically, we we do include one primary species in all of our projects. Um, It's the scientific name is Araucaria hunstanii, commonly known as the clinky. And this tree has some really special and unique properties that allow it to be so effective for, for our needs. Our model is, because of the use of clinky, we're able to essentially double the carbon capture of most other reforestation models. We mix the clinky with any number of species that are native to Costa Rica, where we are planting our our forests. For example, in the New England Biolabs project, uh, we have about 30 different species that we're using. And those species all have their you know, specific functions. Some of them are included to specifically for wildlife purposes to um, encourage more fauna in the forest. Some are designed to uh, generate the profits or the income that the landowners need. Some of them are um, included for the purposes of long-term carbon capture. So yeah, we're, we're trying to create as, as biodiverse a forest as possible that still is highly efficient in carbon capture. And again, uh, going back to the, the income piece for the farms. Yeah, it sounds like a really well-designed forest that you're implementing. And I love hearing more about the species that are used in the NEB forest that you're helping us plant. Could you tell us about how much carbon the the forests that you plant are capturing every year? Sure. So uh, we conduct our annual measurements and we've been doing so for over 20 years. And then we've also gone through third-party verification process, which has revealed that our forests on average 
are sequestering uh, 25 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year. If you look at the literature uh, for most reforestation or forestry projects in general, again, that's about double what you would expect on average. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So where are you currently replanting forests? Is it only in Costa Rica? Yeah, right now we we are um, strictly operating in Costa Rica. We've been there um, for decades, and it's it's a really you know, comfortable place to operate. Uh, Costa Rica has a long history with environmental stewardship. Uh, when we're engaging potential partners in the project, I think a lot of people understand you know the aims of and goals of of the project. Uh, and then, you know, on a policy basis, it's, it is really friendly towards reforestation. So it's been a, a really effective laboratory for, for us, but we've now reached the point where we do want to expand to other countries. So I have um, ongoing conversations with stakeholders in Latin America and even in Southeast Asia, um, because if we do want to really make a difference in the climate change equation, um, we have to really plant a lot more of our forest. Yeah, I hope that comes to fruition. I'd love to I'd love to see more forests being planted throughout the world to help offset the carbon emissions. You know, I think it's going to be really hard to meet some of the goals that leaders have set out for in various countries in terms of reducing carbon emissions and I think that reforestation can be a really powerful tool in helping us achieve that. It is. Uh, Reforestation is a very efficient and cost-effective way to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's not the only tool we need, but it is it is essential. It's um, it's really an unavoidable piece of the puzzle because we do need to physically (laughs) intervene to to pull that excess CO2 out of the atmosphere. So we are working on you know, say we globally, um, the world is working on some other technologies, but we have this ancient approach that um, has so many other benefits beyond the carbon aspect. And um, again, it's it's a really cost effective way to deal with emissions. Yeah. Speaking of those other benefits, do you have any uh, stories that you can share about biodiversity success that you've seen in reforestation projects? Absolutely. So the way this project was conceived many years ago was it was really based on the carbon aspect. How do we accumulate carbon in a given land area and have it make sense for those landowners? So um, we always knew that we wanted to create, you know, a mixed species model. and, And with that comes a certain level of biodiversity. But there was never a really strong focus on the habitat that we'd be creating. Um, so over the years, it's it's been a very pleasant surprise to see how healthy, from an ecological standpoint, the, the forests actually are. Within our forests, we have documented essentially every fauna species that you can imagine in Costa Rica. This includes some endangered species, threatened species, and it also includes the very elusive and iconic species of Costa Rica, um, such as the jaguar, uh, tapir the macaws, toucans, et cetera, et cetera. So we, in, in some of our older forests, we've uh, set up uh, like camera traps and um, have been successful in, in capturing images of these animals. We also regularly see tracks, you know, from some of the harder animals to find, the jaguar and the tapir. We regularly see tracks in our forests. In fact, uh, I was just down in Costa Rica a couple weeks ago, and about 100 yards from the New England Biolabs forest, I saw a large tapir track in the mud. And these are very rare animals. Um, people that you know work in the field within Costa Rica can go their whole life and never even see one. So uh, f- for me, it's really exciting that they're, they are residents within our forests. Yeah, I think it's exciting too. And I've really enjoyed seeing the images on Reforce the Tropics Instagram account um, and other social media accounts. I always get excited when I see uh, a print being shared or a still image captured of one of the animals exploring your forest. So I think that's really awesome. In fact, for the NEB project, as we were planting, so we required a, a small army of, of workers um, and they were they were camping on the site, you know, just for ease of operations. And we saw so much jaguar activity in the area that we actually had to 
we, we had to change it from a camp to to building wooden structures um, to protect the workers. So we know there's quite a bit of jaguar movement throughout the NEB forest already, and we expect that to grow as the forest matures. Well, we love hearing about it. So I was wondering, Greg, if COVID-19 has had any effect on your efforts in reforestation? It has. Uh, it hasn't been drastic effects. Uh, I can give full credit to my team in Costa Rica who picked up a lot of the slack on, on some of the, you know, the pieces that I couldn't do for, for you know, lack of being able to travel. So from an operational standpoint, uh, we've weathered the pandemic quite well. All of our projects are in excellent uh, condition. Um, for me personally, the I think the hardest part has been the relationship end of things. So it's really important to, to build those relationships with our partners in Costa Rica. And, and of course, that's most effective in person. And then beyond that, you know, just I think a reality that most nonprofits have faced through this is, is the financial piece. Um, you know, there's been sort of less disposable income for charitable giving, you know, even on, on company level. Um, I think we've seen that people or companies have been a little bit more reluctant to make sizable investments into their sustainability. So yeah, our fundraising has taken a small hit overall, though. I think we're in a really good position. And um, as we hopefully emerge from this pandemic, we are geared up for major expansion in the future. Well, I can't wait to see that. Speaking of, where do you hope to see Reforest the Tropics in the next five or 10 years? Well, our, our goal is to make a tangible difference um, in the climate change equation. We, we feel that or we know that we have a model that works, that's improved over most other options that are available. So our goal is to plant our forests in the, in the millions of hectares where right now we're, we're far below that. We are exploring various uh, strategies to, to accomplish that. I think for me, one of the more exciting one is a training the trainers model where we invite other nonprofits, um, government agencies from throughout the tropics to learn about our model on site in Costa Rica, train them how to execute it and allow them to go and replicate in any number of countries. We feel that's a, a, an effective way to scale our model. Um, beyond that, you know, we internally, we're just, we're looking for new partners all the time. As I'd mentioned, we're looking to expand beyond the borders of Costa Rica, plant as much as we possibly can, because this, this climate change issue, um, you know, we have a very short window to deal with it. And we have a very, a very effective tool with the RTT model to, to help. Yeah, I think so too. And I'm so happy to hear that you're sharing your knowledge and the lessons that Reforest the Tropics has learned over the long life that it's had so far and really the forward thinking aspects that you've brought to the table. It's really nice to be able to hear that you're sharing those with other individuals who can bring that knowledge to other countries and really help reforest lots of areas around the globe that can support these types of diverse forests to help draw the carbon out of the atmosphere to really help us meet some of these environmental goals that are quite lofty, but, you know, so important for the survival of our planet and our species, I think. So I really appreciate your efforts. And it's really great to hear that, you know, you're spreading that knowledge throughout the the world. Yes, thank you. Uh, we've we've always maintained the philosophy of sort of open source in terms of our our findings and our model. Again, this you know we, we're looking at the big picture here of of removing over a billion metric tons of excess CO two from the atmosphere. So we're certainly not going to be able to do that on our own. Um, so we want to share what we think is is a improvement to anybody who's interested. It's a daunting task, and we appreciate your efforts. Thank you. And I hope to uh, speak to you again sometime in the future and hear how the reforestation movement has spread across the world and hear how the flora and fauna are thriving in the forests that you've planted for New England Biolabs. Yes, thank you. Anytime, I'd, I'd be happy to speak with you again. Thanks so much for making time in your schedule today, Greg. We'll talk soon. 
All right. Thanks a lot, Lydia. Take care. Thank you for joining me today. If you'd like to learn more about Reforest the Tropics, or if you'd like to sponsor a reforestation project of your own, please check out reforestthetropics.org. Hope you'll join us for our next episode when we begin a series focused on infectious disease research, diagnostics, detection, and surveillance.